All right, Jeremiah chapter 20. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now Pasher, the son of Emer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. What did Jeremiah prophesy? He told them if they didn't get right with God and repent from following other gods and repent from serving false gods and denying God, then God was going to send great destruction upon Israel and God was going to hold them accountable and uh, they were going to die by the sword and by pestilence and by famine and God uh, lays it out there for them through the prophet Jeremiah. And of course... Uh, a lot of people can't take something up with God, so they take it up with God's man, as we're about ready to find out. Look with me in verse number 2. Then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. And it came to pass on the morrow that Pasher brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then said Jeremiah unto him, The Lord hath not called thy name Pasher, but Magar Misabib. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends. They shall fall by the sword of their enemies. Thine eyes shall behold it, and I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. And he shall carry them captive into Babylon and shall slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city and all the labors thereof, and all the precious things thereof, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah will I give into the hand of their enemies, which shall spoil them, and take them, and carry them to Babylon. But the, And thou, Pasher, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity, and thou shalt come to Babylon, and there thou shalt die, and be buried there, thou and all thy friends, to whom thou hast prophesied lies. Now look at verse 7. O Lord, thou hast deceived me. This is Jeremiah talking to the Lord. And I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Every one mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me in a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Let's pray. Our Father, we sure do bless you. Lord, there's been a sweet spirit in the house of God tonight. Lord, the singing has blessed my heart. Lord, I thank you for, Lord, the words of the songs and the spirit they were sung in. Lord, they were sung not to entertain or put on a show. They were sung as praise unto God and to honor our darling Savior. Lord, I thank you, Father, for the good fellowship time before service. Thank you for the good prayer time. Thank you, Lord, for the good service this morning. Thank you, Father, for answering prayer. And thank you, Father, for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank you for the good testimonies, Lord. No one testified to bring attention to themselves. They testified to your greatness and what you've done in their lives. Now, Father, for the next few minutes, I pray you'd put a hedge about this place. I pray that you'd arrest our hearts and our attention. I pray that Jesus would be magnified greatly, and I pray that everyone would come face to face with what thus saith the Lord. Now, Father, I pray you'd use this unworthy vessel. Lord, I realize there are some here tonight that have heard this message. But, Lord, there are many who have not. Regardless, Lord, uh, no one's ever heard it preached like you'll preach it tonight. Amen. So, Father, I pray you'd help us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And I pray that, Lord, you'd deal with us accordingly. I certainly pray if there's anybody amongst us unsaved that tonight would be the night of their salvation. I pray, Father, for those that are saved, uh, 
that, Lord, uh, uh, you'd speak to their hearts personally. Lord, there may be some here tonight that's saved, uh, but they've drifted a little bit. They're not as close to you as they once were. I pray by the final amen of this service that will not be the case. Uh, I pray they be found right smack dab in the center of the will of God. Uh, there may be some here tonight that are struggling, Lord. Uh, uh, they're faced with opposition and obstacles in their life. Uh, and Father, they're struggling. Uh, and Father, struggling to put one step of faith in front of the other. Uh, Lord, I pray tonight you'd go by their way. Uh, God, you'd strengthen their faith. Uh, you'd help them in their struggles. Uh, they realize that you are a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Uh, Father, there may be some of your children here tonight, uh, Lord, uh, uh, that are standing their post, uh, that are being faithful, uh, that are striving to do their best to die daily and serve the Lord. Uh, but, Father, we don't know what a day brings forth. Uh, Lord, we don't know what's on the horizon, but you do. Uh, and, Father, I pray you do something down in the gable into their soul uh, uh, to help them to stay steadfast, uh, unmovable, uh, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Uh, now, Father, I pray, uh, uh, Lord, you'd have your will and way now, uh, and we'll bless you, we'll praise you, and thank you for all that you do. Uh, for it's in the wonderful and holy and glorious name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Uh, Amen uh, and amen. Uh, I want to draw your attention to a couple things. Uh, uh, first of all, I want you to notice uh, uh, the great man of God, Jeremiah, is confined in the stocks. Uh, 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 some of you kids might have to look that up on Google. Uh, uh, but back in olden days, uh, what they would do is they would take a prisoner uh, and they would put him uh, on public display in something called the stocks. Uh, it was a big wooden panel. It had three holes in it. Uh, two were for the hands uh, and one was for the head. Uh, and that board would come down on top of them and they couldn't get out of it. They were locked in it uh, and they were there and people would go by uh, and spit on them and laugh at them and mock them uh, and throw things at them. Uh, and here they took the man of God, uh, God's prophet, uh, the anointed for Israel uh, and they put him in stocks right outside the temple uh, and all the naysayers uh, all the false prophets, uh, all the ones uh, that were against the will of God uh, made fun of him uh, and they laughed at him uh, and they threw things at him uh, and they made uh, uh, the people to think, who is this man? Uh, uh, who does he think he is? Uh, uh, he's guilty of one thing, friends. Uh, he's guilty of preaching the word of God. Uh, we see the confining of the stocks. Uh, in these verses we find uh, the cost of sin. In verses 4 through 6, uh, uh, the prophet lets them know uh, they'll be carried off into Babylon. Uh, they're going to die there. Uh, they're going to be slain there. Uh, uh, all their false lies and false prophecies uh, and all they've done to hurt Israel, they'll give an account uh, there in Babylon. Uh, uh, can I say God is not mocked? Uh, uh, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Uh, uh, nobody's getting away with anything. Uh, God is keeping a record uh, and God's going to judge people someday uh, and then we find the cry of the servant in verses 7 through 9 now notice some things about the prophet Jeremiah and I'm going to give you some things and then I'm going to give you where this message came from can I say I want you to notice first of all that Jeremiah is greatly discouraged I don't know about you but if I was putting stocks outside the house of God and everybody made fun of me, I'd get a little discouraged too. Uh, some of you all, if the preacher don't shake your hand or if so-and-so don't uh, hug your neck, you get discouraged. The man of God has been preaching now for some 24 years for Israel to get right with God. And he's seen no fruit. He's not built a big tabernacle full of people. He's not got folks coming up and shaking his hand, telling him how great a job he's doing. He's not got a bus with his picture on it and his name on it. He's got zero results from a lifetime of preaching. He's discouraged. Can I say tonight, you could be living for God, 
You can be in the center of the will of God. Uh, you can be striving to do right. Uh, uh, you can strive to please God. Uh, you can pray. Uh, uh, you can be faithful to the house of God. Uh, you can be faithful in your giving. Uh, you can be faithful in your witnessing. Uh, you can do everything right and still get discouraged. Matter of fact, I, I dare say if you're doing everything out right, you are a candidate to really get discouraged. We're living in a day and age where people don't respect old-time worship. People don't respect the things of God. Uh, 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 we're living, as Brother Jeffrey uh, said this morning, people can go to a ball game, shout their lungs out. You come to the house of God, somebody say amen, uh, and they want them carried out. You're getting too anxious in the house of God. Uh, we live in a day and age where people don't know what preaching is. Preaching is proclaiming the Word of God. Preaching is to cry loud with a loud voice. People don't understand, uh, and they're taking them out of a lot of false churches, which I'm glad. Uh, this thing is called a pulpit. It's called a pulpit because uh, the man of God is supposed to have a message from God, uh, and he reaches out and he's pulling sinners out of the pit of sin uh, so they can get saved by the grace of God. Uh, can I say, uh, preaching is a reckoning. And he has preached his heart out. And he's discouraged. Can I say, he's not only discouraged, he feels deceived. Look in verse number 7. He says, O Lord, thou hast deceived me. And I was deceived. Jeremiah has got to the point he's forgotten what God told him when God called him. Jeremiah, like every young preacher I've ever known, every young preacher I've ever known thought they had the answer. They was going to turn the world upside down. Uh, they was going to preach and everybody was going to flock to Jesus. Uh, uh, people were going to get saved in droves and great revival was going to break out and they were going to be used to God. Well, the only problem is we got an enemy called the devil. And he hates preaching, and he hates preachers. And he does things to discourage preachers. Huh? Listen, I've seen preachers one even wet behind the ears trying to correct a man of God been preaching 50 years. Huh? Think they got all the answers until they face a little adversity. In chapter 1, Jeremiah is called of God, and God tells him, he said, I knew thee when I formed thee in the belly. Right. So by the way, in case you don't know, which I know this church should know, the moment conception is made in the womb, it's a life. Uh, I, it's unfathomable to me that they can let it be born and then kill it and call it abortion. But yet a pregnant woman gets killed in a car accident and they'll charge the man who hit her uh, uh, with involuntary manslaughter for two lives, the mother and the infant in the womb. Uh, God told Jeremiah, when I formed you in the belly, I knew you. But he goes on to say that he wanted him to go and preach to Israel. And he said, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar. Uh, he said, don't be dismayed at their faces. Uh, he said, I want you to go preach my word. Uh, and he says, they're not going to hear you. They're uncircumcised of heart. Uh, uh, they're going to uh, reject you uh, because they reject me. Uh, but go preach it anyway. Uh, hey, what a just God we have. Uh, he could have kicked us all off into hell. Uh, but no, he still sends preachers uh, to preach the word of God. And then people will have to decide what they'll do with it. God never told Jeremiah he's going to win Israel. He told him the opposite. But discouragement has a way of messing with our minds. Now he feels deceived. And he feels that God's the one that deceived him. Can I help you? The Bible makes it clear it's impossible for God to lie. God's never deceived anybody. The deceiver is the devil. We find he's discouraged. He feels deceived. 
We also find he's in derision. Look what it says there again in verse number 7. He says, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. And that word derision means humiliated, belittled, mocked. Now listen, I, I don't know about you. I can take attacks, but I don't like being mocked. I don't like being belittled and humiliated. That don't, that don't rub well with me, huh? I just don't like it when people make a mockery of what I'm standing for. Well, that's where he's at. And he's in derision daily. Every time the sun comes up, he knows what's happening. They're going to mock him. They're going to belittle him. They're going to humiliate him. He walks down the streets. They're going, oh, there's that prophet. Thinks he knows everything. You see, in Jeremiah's day, they hired prophets to lie to people. Yeah. Told them, everything's good. We've done sought the Lord, and the Lord's going to bless us. Yeah. And the Lord told him through Jeremiah that you have said, thus saith the Lord, when I have not spoken. Yeah. Mm. And Jeremiah's told the truth. And yet he's in derision. I don't know about you, but that word derision comes from another root word that we know as of erosion. It weighs on you and it takes pieces of you away. Listen, I don't care how strong a man or a woman is in Christ. Every hit that you take, it begins to wear away and erode. Listen, when I was a young preacher, I was ready to charge hell with a water pistol. Bring it on, devil. That's what, that was my mindset. Huh? I had a pastor at one time said that, you know, if your church is having problems, have Doug come over there. God will either send revival or Doug will burn it down, one or the other. I mean, that was, that was what I was known for. That's not a good thing to be known for, but that's what I was known for. No, I wasn't afraid of anybody. But now that I've been preaching 35 years... And I'm looking at, don't laugh, Miss Lisa, 60. And I've been pastoring for over 25 years. And I've taken hits for 35 years. Some from people, but more from spiritual warfare. I tell you what, you look ahead and you wonder how many hits you got left. I used to like boxing when boxing was real. And I don't care how great a champion. If you hit him enough, he's fallen. Jeremiah's in derision. He's really crying out to the Lord, saying, Lord, I don't know how many more hits I can take. But notice something else about Jeremiah. He's defeated. Look at verse 10. For I've heard the defaming of many, fear on every side. Report, they say, and we will report it. All my familiars watched for my halting, saying, Peradventure he'll be enticed, and we will prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. Jeremiah's defeated. He doesn't have any wind left in his sail. He doesn't know if he can go on anymore. And then, my dear friends, notice that Jeremiah is done. Look what he says, verse number 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. He said, that's it. I'm done. And right there in the middle, verse number 9, Jeremiah throws in the towel. He says, no mas, no mas. No more, no more. I'm done. I 
taken the last blow, taken the last mockery. I've taken all of it that I can take. Amen. Lord, you deceive me. They're mocking me. I'm done. And he throws in the towel. He said, that's it. It's gone. It's over. No more. That's it. I've seen preacher, I've seen people after people after people go through bad things, heartbreaking things, tragic things. I've seen people have greater expectation than man than they should. I've seen young Christians come, come into a church and look around and think, boy, everybody here is holy. Everybody here has got a halo. Everybody here is uh, 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 walking on water only to find out after time that, hey, everybody sitting in here faces the same devil. We got all got problems and we all face things and we all face hurts. Uh, and what happens is they put people on a pedestal uh, and then all of a sudden somebody has a bad day and it lets them down and they quit on God. I've seen people in a myriad of excuses. So that's it. I'm done. Can I say tonight, when you throw in the towel, you devalue what's in the towel. You ever wonder what's in that towel? Huh? So that's more than just a quitting point. Hmm? And I say, Brother Jim, what's in that towel uh, 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 is a whole lot more, and that towel represents a whole lot more and a whole lot bigger things than you and I. Can I say that that towel uh, has the faith which was once delivered unto the saints? Uh, 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 the very Baptist distinctives that we stand for, uh, 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 the things that make us uh, what we are today is in that towel. Uh, 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 when we throw in the towel, uh, uh, we're saying things like the virgin birth of Christ doesn't matter. Uh, what we're saying when we throw in the towel is that the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't matter. Uh, uh, when we throw in the towel, we say Mount Calvary doesn't matter. Uh, when we throw in the towel, we say the local church doesn't matter. Uh, when we throw Throw in the towel. We uh, uh, say the King James Bible doesn't matter. Uh, uh, when we throw in the towel, uh, uh, we say, uh, 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 hey, the security of the believer doesn't matter. Uh, when we throw in the towel, uh, we say all the Baptist distinctives that I spent two months uh, uh, teaching on here a couple years ago, uh, they don't matter anymore. Uh, let the charismatics have it. Uh, let the Catholics have it. Uh, let the Mormons have it. Uh, let the Jehovah's witnesses have it. Uh, let the cults have it. Uh, it doesn't matter anymore uh, because I'm done and I throw in the towel. We take the very name of Jesus and we wipe it under our feet when we throw in the towel. Doesn't matter anymore. Brother Jeffrey, you throw in that towel, you throw Carter away. You're saying, I don't care if this little boy ever hears about Jesus. I don't care if he ever knows anything about church. Uh, I don't care if he ever knows anything about holiness and righteousness and godliness. Uh, I don't care. Uh, I'm throwing him to the wolves of the world in hopes that some way he just finds his way through life. Amen. There are a lot of heartbroken parents because they threw in the towel and they let the world raise their children. Now, uh, they're wondering why their kids don't want to have anything to do with God. Mm -hmm. Brother Ed, Miss Vanessa, your grandchildren's in that towel. It was precious to see them here at church with you this morning. But you quit on God, you might as well throw them off. Saying there's no hope for them. I know it's hard. Your family's in that towel. I know that you'd give up everything you own to see your family sitting next to you in church worshiping God. To have that again in your life. See your grandbabies here worshiping God. <laughs> you quit. Through that towel. 
all those prayer requests for your grandparents, your family get saved, they're in that towel. You quit. No oh, hope. Oh. Tell the roses in that towel. Miss Pam, your lost family. They're in that towel. Amen. Miss Noreen, your family's in that towel. You're that one thread between them and God. Amen. You throw in that towel, there's no hope for them. Right. Hmm. But the Tommy, your old boy's in that towel. Your daughter's in that towel. Amen. You throw it in. Miss Barb, your nephew and his family, they're in that towel. Miss Mays lived her life. That mantle's fell to you. You're the one stop sign between them and hell. And you throw in that towel. There's no hope. No hope. Amen. Hmm? We can go around the room. You throw in that towel, you're saying, I don't care about my family. I don't care about Jesus. I don't care about the church. I don't care about anything else. Brother Sammy, it's not only ambassador in that towel. It's not only Dale and Savina and Shane and, and, and Sam and all the dear folks down there. The Caribbean's in that towel, son. Huh? You're burdened. Christ for the Caribbean. You quit now. We'll never see it happen. You're in that towel. Kenzie, Sammy, Xander, your daddy's in that towel. How many times have I asked, heard you ask, pray for my daddy? He's in that towel. You quit. He may never get saved. Hmm? Listen, I know the derision is not easy. I know the defeats aren't easy. I know the heartache and the pain that you face from time to time. It's not easy. Uh, but friend, when you throw in the towel, it's bigger than what you're facing. Amen. Jeremiah quit. He said, that's it. I'm done. It doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Mm -mm. I know preachers that have thrown in the towel. I've known churches that have thrown in the towel. I've known Christians that have thrown in the towel. I've known some that would stand and teach and preach the Word of God. Tonight, they're gone. Tonight, their families are in disarray because they threw in the towel. Let me help you with something, friend. There's not a halo in the building. There's nobody in here exempt from problems. And there's nobody in here exempt from the judgment of God if you quit on Him. Say, well, I'll quit and live my life and it'll be all right. Naomi said, I went out full and I came back empty. I've never seen anybody go out full and come back full. Hmm? I'm glad for the Word of God. I'm glad for the Word of God because if we stop reading in verse number 9 in the middle of it, that would be a pretty depressing story. But look what he said. He said, but... That's a wonderful conjunction. Amen. That means something's about to change. He says, but... Now he quit. He said, but... His word... was in mine heart... 
as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. He said, I quit, but I couldn't stay quit. He said, there was something in me that wouldn't quit. I quit, but what God had put in me wouldn't quit. It just began to blaze a little bit. Uh, it was like God had stoked them coals, and all of a sudden uh, there uh, well, happened to be a burning st uh, start. Uh, look in verse 11. Uh, look what he says. But, there it is again, the Lord is with me uh, as a mighty terrible one. Uh, therefore my persecutors shall stumble. Uh, they shall not prevail. Uh, they shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Uh, their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. Uh, look at verse 13. Uh, Sing unto the Lord. Uh, Praise ye the Lord, uh, for he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of the evildoers. Uh, uh, Jeremiah said, I'm done and I quit, uh, but there was a fire happening. Uh, and all of a sudden he said, my persecutors uh, will not prevail against me. Uh, then he says, sing unto the Lord. Uh, Praise the Lord, uh, for he delivered me. Uh, Jeremiah got his towel back. Uh, he said, hey, uh, I love the Lord. Uh, I love the church. Uh, I love the Word of God. Uh, I love the truths of the Bible. Uh, I love my family. Uh, I love the goodness of God. Uh, I don't want to see any harm brought to him. Uh, I want to see the blessings of God. Uh, God, forgive me. Uh, I don't want to quit. Uh, God, let me have my towel back. Uh, Jeremiah got his towel back. Uh, he got to singing and praising God uh, and worshiping. Uh, listen, his circumstances had not changed, uh, but there was a change on the inside of him. Uh, hey, the Lord showed up big in his soul. Uh, hey, hey, hey. Can I say the next time you feel like throwing in the towel, yeah. throw it up. And say, Lord, I need some help. I'm a struggling. God, will you help me not to throw in my towel? I don't even know how many years ago it was. I was preaching in Mississippi in a revival. And it was a kind of an odd situation. Revival started on Wednesday and ended on Sunday. Normally, revival started on Sunday. I was preaching, there was two preachers, me and another fella, and we was alternating nights, and the preacher would have sometimes both of us preach, and, and there wasn't anything happening, Brother Bob, in this revival meeting. I mean, there, you, you couldn't get an amen, you couldn't get a grunt, even the babies wouldn't cry. I mean, that it was the deadest church revival I've ever seen in my life. I'm not even, I'm not kidding. Everybody was like, Ed, wake up, Ed. I mean, it was all, I mean, it was a mess. And we was preaching our hearts out, preaching our lungs like leather, trying to stir up something. Nothing happening. Two young, crazy preachers from South Carolina heard that I was preaching revival in Mississippi. And on Saturday, they drove from South Carolina to Mississippi. Just so happened that night, the other preacher was preaching. And with my hand toward God, he preached one of the greatest messages I'd heard. And it didn't get much farther than the pulpit. I mean, me and them two preachers were trying to help him. We was amening and nothing, no movement, nothing. I mean, nothing. Not, I'm talking about for four nights, not one person's come to the altar. Not one person's led in silent prayer. I mean, nothing is happening. After the invitation, and once again, nobody came, the pastor got up. He addressed the congregation. He said, Church, I really prayed that God would send revival and God put it on my heart to have it this week and he put these men on my heart and these men have preached their hearts out and he said and I don't understand it there is nothing happening he said and God's let me know 
that if we show up tomorrow and something doesn't happen, I'm resigning as pastor of this church. And then he looked at us preachers and said, Preachers, could you come early tomorrow? We're not going to have Sunday school. Just come early and we'll pray. You're dismissed. Boy, that was a real blessing. Uh, well, me and them two crazy preachers went to, I believe it's Chili's. Was it Chili's, Jeff? Yeah, we went to Chili's. And we're sitting there doing what Baptist preachers do, feed our face and talk about the Bible. And we got to talking about the Bible. And we got to talking about the goodness. And these young preachers, I mean, Jeffrey, you, what, you was preaching, what, maybe two months or something, three months, if that. I mean, you just started. And, and I don't know how long Kyle been preaching, but the young preacher, they're sitting there with their mouths wide open, you know. And I, I just throwing out some things, and we was having a good time and everything. And uh, we stayed there and fellowship. And before long, the pastor come over, and he was fellowshipping with us. And we just have a good time at Chili's. So we got the car to go over to the hotel, and I told that illustration about that little girl that had them plastic pearls, and she loved them pearls more than life. And every day for two weeks, her daddy come in and said, why don't you give me them pearls? And she said, oh, no, daddy, you can have my dolls, you can have this, but not my pearls. I love my pearls. I love my pearls. Finally, after two weeks, that little girl comes in. She hands her daddy them pearls, and she said, here, Daddy, if you want them that bad, you can have them. And when she gave him them plastic, cheap, little dollar store pearls, he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a real strand. And he put them around and he said, I've had these all the time, just waiting for you to give up those for the real ones. Sure. And I told that illustration. We got out of the hotel. We got in the elevator, and that big old boy got the kicking and stomping in that elevator because it hit him about that time. How much God's already had it for us for a long time, just waiting for us to give up the junk so he can give us the goods. Yeah. Them elevator doors open, and to this day, I don't know what happened to you. He shot out of there. I don't know where he went. I mean, it was boom. By the time I stepped out of the elevator, no Jeffrey. I mean, he's gone. It was a boom. He's gone. Exploded. Huh? We got back over in the hotel room and enjoying the goodness of God. What room number was it? La Quintin? 222. Well, he's in that hotel room, Brother Ron, enjoying the goodness. I mean, just enjoying God. Well, he's just having a time. About that time, that was when Brother Greg was going through depression. And what I know now that I didn't know then, he almost took his life. Had a pistol in his top drawer of his, of his, of his desk, and the devil kept saying, why don't you just end this thing? He was so depressed over some church problems. And Brother Jeffrey said, can we pray for my dad? And we got to pray, and you should have heard that boy praying for his dad. And we got to calling on God. And I'm not charismatic. I don't have a charismatic bone in my body. But I am a Bible believer. And I do know there's a half that's not told. And I do know there's some things I can't understand and explain. But I know at some point, as we're praying there in 222, room La Quinta Inn, it wasn't the Holy Ghost showed up. The Lord Himself walked into that room. Uh, I mean, He walked right by me. You say, how do you know that? Because I could smell Him. Uh, said, did you look at Him? I was afraid to look up. Uh, I was afraid He'd strike me dead. I mean, He walked right by me. Uh, there was a breeze that came from the glory world. Uh, he walked in there. Uh, he sat down amongst us for a little while. Uh, uh, then he decided to go back to his throne room. Uh, and I want to tell you, three young preachers in that place had themselves a spell. Uh, we shouted and ran and kicked and screamed. Uh, I don't know how they didn't throw us out. Uh, but we had a time there that night uh, when the Lord showed up. Amen. You say, I don't believe it. I don't care. I was there. Ask him. He walked right in there, didn't he? Hey, all I know in Song of Solomon, when she got over there, she could smell that myrrh where he'd been. I want to tell you something. I smelled him that day. I would never smelled anything like it since. But can I say, we got over that church house the next morning, and I, we're still, we're still giddy. I don't even know if we slept that night. We're still giddy, man. We'd met with God. And we walked in there, and that pastor said, called him Jeff, said, Jeff, I want you to lead singing. 
And when he gets done leading the congregation and singing, Brother Doug, I'm turning it over to you, and you just do what God tells you to do. Let's pray. We got in the altar, and then it hit me. The weight of that man's ministry was now on me. The future of that church was now resting on me. And I'm in the altar, and I'm, I just got real honest with God. I said, God, I don't have anything to help these people. I said, Lord, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to show me something. You're going to have to tell me what message. Lord, I don't know what in the world I'm doing. And about that time, the Holy Ghost just basically said, shut up. He said, I got this. And as soon as he said, I got this, I said, whew, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. So well, then we went and sat down in the pew, and I'm thinking, I'm glad you got it. You going to let me know? <laughs> I'm sitting there, and the Lord says, Jeremiah chapter number 20. I said, thank you, Lord. About that time I looked over, and he had a towel from the church, or from the hotel, right there on his Bible. I said, Jeffrey, give me that towel. And God gave me this message you heard tonight in that service. You say, what happened? That preacher's wife got to shouting like a Comanche Indian. That place come alive. People got to hugging one another, loving on one another, apologizing to one another. God breathed in that place. Uh, about 1.30 in the afternoon, they still shouting and having themselves the time. Say, what happened? They got their towel back. Amen. Amen. Tonight, Somebody here tonight feels discouraged. Somebody feels defeated. Somebody feels like God doesn't care anymore. Somebody feels like it's time to quit. Somebody says, well, I don't know if God will give me my towel back. Well, Brother Clint just sang, he let me come back home. So some of you need to get your towel back tonight. Can I say there's no shame in telling the Lord you need your towel back? If Jeremiah had to get his towel back, friend, how many of us need to get our towel back? Some of you may have heard this message and got your towel back at one time but you've laid it down or you lost it you need to get it back listen the future of this church hinges on whether or not you got your towel future of your family hinges on whether or not you got your towel maybe the whole future of Florence hinges on if you got your towel Boy, we've been expecting God to do some things around here. It starts with realizing we can't do it, but He can. And that we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I wonder tonight, have you got your towel? If not, why don't you come get one? i got them all over the front up here. Need a towel? Just come get it. Come on. Don't wait on something else. Just come get your towel. The Lord, He's gracious. He's long send your towel back. He'll let you come back home. Amen. Huh? How about tonight? The preacher, I'm discouraged. I understand. Might need a towel. Come get your towel. We got them. Come get it. The Lord, He'll, he'll encourage you. Amen. So I've been praying, not seeing anything happening. Well, just come get your towel. Don't quit praying. The Lord might just be waiting for you to pick up a towel and hear your prayer. Uh, there's some can't get to. I'll throw some over there. Just come get them. Never quit praying. Don't give up. Get your towel. Get your towel back. 
get one of them conjunctions, but the Lord did something for me tonight. I went in defeated, but I found victory in the Lord. Folks are coming. Folks are praying. Folks are getting their towels back. How about you, friend? Everywhere God has burdened me to preach this message, somebody really got their towel back. Preached this one time. Just felt led to preach it. Had no idea about anything. Just preach. And toward the end of it, I was back before I threw towels all over the place. I just had one towel. And I just tossed it to a young lady in the crowd. Not knowing anything. That young lady and her husband the next day were going to the attorney's office to get a divorce. Her husband wasn't even at church that night. She went home, told him about that message. Broke his heart. Instead of going to the lawyer, they went to the Lord. God fixed that marriage. A couple years later, I was in the same church preaching revival. Watched her husband walk an aisle surrender to preach. Another time I was preaching in a church, preached the message, I was there for revival, preached on Sunday night this message. We come back on Monday and a fellow stood up and testified and said, I shouldn't even be here tonight. Come to find out this fellow had a successful, uh, he was an electrician, had his own business, he was very successful, and his wife got dementia. He had to sell his business and stay home, take care of his wife. A man who's spent his life constantly on the go, serving the Lord, building his business. He was home to eat and sleep, and that was about it. But now all of a sudden, it's all he can do to get to church. His wife's gotten so bad that he's having to pay people to watch her while he's at church. She can't understand why she can't cook anymore. She can't understand why she can't work in the yard anymore. She can't understand why she's in a wheelchair. And, and it's a constant struggle and battle. And there's constant problems. He said they ended up, all they ever did was fight and bicker. And he said every Monday morning there was a therapist that would come in and work with her. And uh, he would be able to go to grocery and run some errands. He already made up his mind before revival started. When that therapist came in on Monday, he was going to get in his truck and drive it off a cliff and end his life. He was done. Lord had me preach that message on Saturday night. He got his towel back. He said, I went home, and they said, I hugged my wife, and I kissed her, and I told her I was sorry for fussing with her. He said, and the Lord helped me that night so much. And then the next day when the therapist come in, I told him about the message. He didn't even work with my wife. He went home to make things right with his wife. Uh, 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 by the uh, Thursday of the meeting, uh, that fellow brought his wife to church with him. First time she'd been able to come to church in years. Uh, and his daughter, who hadn't been in church for 15 years, came with him. Because he got his towel back. I can tell you story after story after story of people that quit, but they got your towel back. It was in St. Lucia. I tossed it to Shane under the tent in revival. He was giving you all kinds of fits, headed the wrong way. Tells me he's got that towel hanging over the door in his office. It's not a day he doesn't walk out and look at that towel. Got his towel back. Doing good. Loves his pastor, serving God, preacher in the church. Just trying to tell you, friends, anybody can face hardship and can face wanting to quit. But God has got a second chances and third chances and fourth. 
it lets you get your towel back. Let me say this, I'll be done. Jeremiah gets down there, verse 13. Sing unto the Lord, praise ye the Lord, for he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evil doers. We go from verse 7 through 9 where he's woe is me, woe is me, to verse 13 where he's praising the Lord because he got his towel back. I wonder tonight, is anybody willing to stand up and say, Preacher, I've been up against it, but tonight I got my towel back. The Lord hit. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.